All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to yet another uh, monthly journal club brought to you by Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, LEAF, um, coming to you from, well, here in the United States at Cooper Union in New York City, and also uh, Steve and Fatima joining us in the UK, and we've got a number of other people joining us as well. I believe this is probably, this is our first journal club of the new year. So um, welcome to 2020, a brand new year. Uh, and we're going to be starting off with, uh, with uh, kind of a rather short article, but a very relevant article. It's a clinical research article um, that involves uh, a, an old favorite of ours, a, a small molecule, rapamycin. Uh, we've talked about it before and how it can basically impact the aging process. Um, it, is, uh, it hits um, TOR, the protein TOR or mTOR in mammals, uh, which is aptly termed target of rapamycin. Uh, it's a drug that is been used clinically for many, many years, um, essentially to suppress the immune system. Um, so for basically for organ transplantations and um, as it, <clears throat> since uh, TOR is impacted uh, by the um, insulin signaling pathway, uh, it also has an effect on lifespan. So, you know, rapamycin and, um, Analogs of rapamycin rapalogs um, have a positive effect on lifespan. Uh, it's been studied in mice and a number of other organisms, and um, you know people are beginning to explore it now um, as far as uh, an intervention, a pharmaceutical intervention in humans. And this is a rather interesting paper because we usually, you know, when we talk about pharmaceuticals, we we think about things that are injectable or swallowed in a pill form or some other form, and um, and we look at uh, how it's, its bioavailability and what effects it has on organs. And, um, but this is a little different and I'm gonna pop the paper open here for you guys. Um, here we go, share the paper. Um, the title of the paper is uh, Topical Rapamycin Reduces Markers of Senescence in Aging in Human Skin, an Exploratory Perspective Randomized Trial. Um, so this is done, I believe, uh, at in Drexel University. I believe they have a uh, medical school, Department of Dermatology, Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, PA. Uh, and one of the, um, right, <clears throat> and uh, so this is a Chung et al. paper. And um, it's basically exploring the use of rapamycin as, I, I guess, um, the term would be a cosmeceutical, right, which is basically a pharmaceutical that's applied topically or, you know, it's applied dermatologically and um, see if it has an effect on aging skin. So a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, cosmetics just cover up, you know, uh, the ravages of aging. Um, but here what's taking place is essentially a pharmaceutical intervention um, because, you know, the skin, the dermis is an organ of the body, right? So, you know, it's, uh, we want to see if, we want to see if rapamycin can directly target this, you know, actually one of the largest organs of our body, which is the skin and performs a vital function, which is uh, basically keeps things from infecting us and, you know, keeps basically uh, <laughs> keeps our organs from falling out, among many other things. Um, and skin degrades over time, right? Because you can get photo aging, you can get, you know, um, uh, lip effusion deposits, uh, you basically have breakdown of collagen, you have cross links, you have all sorts of things happen. And, um, and they need to, they wanna see in this paper whether or not uh, topically uh, adding rapamycin will um, reduce some of these markers. And uh, so let's, uh, let's scroll through the paper here. Um, interestingly, I'm gonna mention, point this out in introduction, you know, people have been studying rapamycin for many years doing mouse models, but um, they mentioned in this paper, um, right in their introduction, um, if I can find it, um, right here, I'm going to just highlight this. With the exception of a small feasibility study, Sing et al. 2016, the potential impact of rapamycin on the aging process in human tissue has not been evaluated, right? So, um, you know, it's a little surprising, right? Because, you know, um, uh, I think the the impact of rapamycin on um, on mTOR, at least uh, at least with regards to its effect on senescent human cells, has been known since like 2000. So uh, you know it's 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 been a long way until we got to this point. So um, so this is a clinical trial and it looks promising. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause this because I think uh, oops. 
stop share, show my face here. So, so that's the trial. Um, it's got 36 people were, were basically recruited to this uh, trial. Uh, Chris Linnell says, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Pleasure for everybody to join us. So we have 36 people. Um, everybody here was over, the, over 40 years of age. Um, just, to, you know, just to show that it's really hard to do these clinical trials. You know, I think that during the course of the trial, 36 people, right? And like 19 people dropped out of the trial, which lasted about six to eight months, which really isn't a long time. Um, you know, uh, but you know, they, to, to get some of the data, they had to do some invasive things like blood draws to see you know, whether or not um, uh, to check the levels of rapamycin in their blood, which actually were below the level threshold of detection, which wasn't surprising because they used a very low amount that was topically administered. Um, and, um, and they had to do punch biopsies, three millimeter punch biopsies, basically take a plug of tissue out of the back, you know, the dorsal area, the back of the hand, where they basically applied this cream, which they mentioned had 10 micromolar um, of rapamycin. Um, and the, the other cream was basically, um, I think it, they said uh, the carrier was DMSO. Um, I don't know what else was in this cream, but you, know, but you could look it up in the paper. There's a trial registration number, clinic, clinicaltrials.gov. I believe this paper is, is, is freely available. Um, so you can, you can get this paper. Um, and it came out recently, um, actually just last year. Um, don't know exactly which month, in Jero Science. So, um, um, so basically what they had people do is they, they gave them randomized containers of, of cream that had rapamycin 10 micromolar. And you know, they, were, they were told to administer it to the back of one hand, one, one bottle, and then another bottle, which was the placebo to the other hand. And it was all kind of randomized. Um, and then they basically did punch biopsies in both hands. So the good thing about this trial was that, you know, to minimize too much random variability between people, you know, you're comparing two hands from the same person, right? So that's that you have, this, uh, you know, supposedly the both arms during the course of the trial were attached to the same person. So, and so therefore they were, you know, we were able to, to get a, to get a, um, I guess, an allogenic comparison. You'd um, certainly hope so. Auto, autogenic comparison. Yeah, you would certainly You'd hope certainly so. You'd certainly hope so. I mean, they, you didn't, know. they didn't mention that. That's an assumption. You know, <laughs> as a scientist, you can never assume, right? Oh, assume the nothing. arms are still attached. You didn't ask for that, but okay. <laughs> um, okay, so so they did this. You know, it's the devil's always in details. I ask myself this. I don't know if I'm, I'm going too far, because like, as soon as I read that, I was like, hmm, how did they administer the cream, right? Because when I do it, right, if I, if somebody, I don't really put, and I get, I, I people come, like, my girlfriend complains that my hands get really chapped because I don't put like moisturizer on my hands. But if I, when I do it, right, I use both hands to slather it all over. So it's really hard for me to put it on one hand, do this. And then what do I do with this hand? Do I wash it first and then dip into this hand and then put it, or do I, how do I, it's kind of hard to not mix up. So it's like, you know, how do you make sure that you get one cream on the other. I, I guess they were rigorous about that somehow. Um, the other thing that they mentioned in the paper, I know I'm getting a little too into the nitty gritty here, right? But if you're putting, if you're putting like placebo on one hand with your right hand, and then you're putting your experimental stuff on the dorsal side with your left hand, then the vice versa should be true on the ventral side of your hand, right? So, you know, maybe you could take a punch biopsy with that, but whatever. I think probably somebody administered it, Oliver, to be fair, but you know, we, we... <laughs> I don't know. They had to do it every day for six months. So I think they gave it to them at home to take it. Mm. Right. So it does anyway, raise some questions, doesn't it? Maybe somebody at home helped them. Cause I can't see it. Oh, we're getting into the weeds here. I think. Yeah. Anyway, but you know, the weeds are important that may attribute for some, some error, you know, then maybe the error could mm. get, get, you know, closed because you might get some whatever. Um, Cross contamination. It's possible. Yeah. So just to give you an example of the low amount of rapamycin, I'm just skipping now way to the back of the paper. Then we're going to jump in back into the paper and look at the data. Um, I said 10 micromolar, and just to give you a reference, and the authors handily give us a reference here. Um, they say the notable aspect of the study is the use of such a low dose of rapamycin, 10 micromolar, um, or 0.001%, which I guess going by weight volume maybe, uh, for topical application. Um, topical treatment with higher concentrations 
0.1 to 1%, so basically 100 to 1,000 times more, has been employed for the treatment of uh, tuberous sclerosis complex, TSC, in adults and children, and has shown efficacy in the inhibition of the benign growths associated with the disorder without serious adverse events. So I don't know how long they had to apply this, probably for a fairly long time too. Um, they said they chose to use rapamycin at a, well, tenfold lower, but it's even more so than that. Um, so, you know, uh, because concentrations using TSC patients were intended to inhibit cell growth while our aim was to improve cell function while maintaining proliferative potential. So anyway, very low dose that they used, but for a long period of time, six to eight months. So that's the, that's the, uh, uh, that's the setup. So let's share this paper. Um, I think this is the paper. Yeah, that's the paper. Um, so should be words like dermatology popping up here. Okay, so the results. So demographics, you can look at that. Most of them are female, like, you know, two thirds, three quarters. Um, most were white, um, smattering of, of different ethnicities, black, Hispanic, Asian total. Um, detectable rapamycin, so they did, um, uh, they did uh, gas chromatography, I believe. Um, they couldn't detect rapamycin in the blood, um, which it was below their limit of detection, which was one nanogram per mil, which is probably not surprising because they're just applying it topically to one hand, right? And um, like once every, they say 24 to 48 hours. So I don't know about the variability there. Um, so again, they, I think, um, you know, the, they had like 13 people do their blood draw. So out of, you know, 36 people, um, quite a quite a substantial amount, you know, approximately a little less than half dropped out. So it's it's hard running these clinical trials, um, you know, with, with a lot of people, especially if they're gonna be somewhat invasive. So what did they look at? So they mentioned in the paper that they primarily looked at um, two endpoints, two, two types of endpoints. The primary endpoint was the levels of P16, uh, inc 4 a protein, um, because that goes up in senescent cells. So we've talked about this uh, prior. So that's, you know, and that's, uh, that's a measure of, 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 senes of cellular, uh, cellular senescence, at least one measure. Um, so cells, um, you know, are inhibited by this protein, their growth. Um, and then the secondary endpoints were basically the dermatologic endpoints. Uh, there are additional markers of senescence. So they looked at, you know, collagen seven, which is distributed, but they also looked at um, the appearance of the skin. And there are these, um, you know, there are these uh, uh, methods that you could use. And I'm just gonna pull up one of them here. I just, some random website called Four Skin Solutions. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing here and I'm gonna, share my screen here. Um, I believe this is it. Might be a little too small, so let me know. Is this, is this visible, everybody? Um, bunch of hands, basically. Um, grade zero, one, two, three, four, Mertz hand grading scale. So there's a couple other grading scales, but basically, you know, grade zero is a nice, healthy hand, which is no loss of fatty tissue, but you could see that you basically, um, you get a loss of connective tissue and a loss of fatty tissue and you know you have tendons popping out um marked visibility of veins so on and so forth and they don't mention this here but you get see you know lipofusin deposits so there's there there are this this hand grading scale and you could probably do this somewhat objectively if you know if i i guess if you had a computer that you know um took an image and basically compared compared the several hands together so i'm going to stop sharing that all right so that's just one example. They used a couple of other scales, but I think I think you kind of get the picture there for for um, for the sake of dermatology. What what we're looking for here? Um, okay, back to the paper. Okay, so um, so the most robust data, which was their primary data, which is basically the P sixteen data. Um, I don't know uh, what did they look at here. How many skin biopsies? Um, I don't have. I had the number here. I want to say, oh, number is eight. So, so I guess eight people, you know, agreed to be biopsied, right? Not, not everybody wants this punch biopsy. Um, I guess it kind of, you know, it sort of contravenes what you're telling people. I want to put something in your hand to make it more youthful, but then I want to take a plug out of your hand, right? And put a scar there, but it's pretty small. It's three millimeters. So, um, 
So this is, um, you know, from one hand to the other, right? So, you know, uh, you could see it looks like a 50% uh, decrease with that after rapamycin treatment. This is after six to eight months. So this is staining for P16 positive cells, placebo. This is an example, placebo, rapamycin. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a decrease, right? So you have a decrease in, in P16 positive cells. Um, a lot of the, some of the other markers that they mentioned, like when I was reading the paper, I said, well, why, why didn't they look at senescence associated secretory phenotype markers, right? SASP, right? Because, you know, senescent cells secrete all these different factors, uh, metalloproteases, all these other things that, you know, things that are pro-inflammatory. Um, you know, they mentioned in the paper, they really couldn't do it based on the, the small amount of tissue that they had available, right? So they couldn't, and, and the SASP factors are found in really small amounts, nanomolar amounts. So it was, it was hard for them with the amount of material. I mean, they, they didn't have a mouse here that they can, you know, sacrifice and take as much, you know, parts as they can. So um, they, they couldn't, they didn't look at, so there's a lot of follow-up that could be done. They didn't look at SAS, but, but P16 definitely went down. Um, they also noticed several other things. Um, one was, you know, there's something called solar elastosis. Um, I don't know why there's no figure here or if they were able to actually quantify this, but from this one image here, which I'm taking to be representative, again, I don't have an image here for quantification or a, a graph, um, but you have this, this, these disorganized collagen fibers, which you have this uh, protein called elastin that builds up. And um, basically it's a consequence of, you know, um, photo effects, photo aging, and that seemed to be reversed, they mentioned to some degree. I don't know exactly what. Um, and there's also another factor that they looked at, which was uh, cytokeratin, CK56, which is staining. Um, and in normal tissues, I'm not a dermatologist, but evidently it stays at this lower stratum area. And when the cells divide, um, they differentiate, but there's, they say there's incomplete differentiation and you get more of this um, CK56, this cytokeratin uh, appearing in, high, in, you know, in, in higher levels of the dermis. Again, um, not a dermatologist here, so I, you know, according to them, that improves cytokeratin distribution. But you know, unlike the P16, my one, you know, I guess one negative I would say here is that unlike the P16, which they had a number and they, you know, quantified it, you know, to um, a significant degree here, I don't see that for the disorganized collagen fibers for solar elastosis and the, um, you know, the uh, CK56 staining, but what they do, um, oh, actually that's in figure three, but figure two, let's, let's just, uh, I was gonna show you the hands here. Um, what they also do, uh, and this is kind of interesting, they look at collagen seven staining, which is, uh, you can clearly see it here that you have collagen seven at this uh, basal lamina, which is basically, you know, collagen is a protein that's found in extracellular matrix and it's found in the basal lamina and it's basically there to tether the skin, to basically anchor it um, to underlying layers. And, uh, you know, the more collagen seven you have there, the, 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 I guess the more firm your skin is, the, the more it's, um, you know, the better it's it, adhering. And they had significantly more collagen seven staining uh, from N6 biopsies from patients, placebo and rapamycin um, staining. But they, interestingly, they mentioned in the paper that they, they were doing also RNA analysis and they did not see elevated collagen for uh, collagen, sorry, seven expression. And, and they, they kind of were at odds as how to explain that, whereas clearly there was more protein, but it, in the location where it's supposed to be, but not more expression. And they weren't sure if that basically meant that, uh, well, they, they had some explanation here. Let me try to see if I can uh, one quantifiable aspect is incorporation of collagen seven to the basement membrane. Um, Although the mechanism whereby rapamycin may increase collagen seven is not clear at the time, um, you know they argue that maybe maybe collagen seven is being processed uh, better. You know the misfolded collagen. So what you're seeing is 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 properly folded collagen seven because they you know they don't seem to see a you know an increase in um, RNA. So you know they do mention that. So they do point that out in their studies that there is some paradox here. Um, there's always paradoxes in biology, but eventually they get resolved. But you see increased 
collagen seven staining, right? So these are like two markers with healthier skin. But of course, you know, all of this is molecular. I mean, how does it really look? And they only have two hands here. Um, be nice. I don't have the supplemental up, so I can't really, you know, it'd be nice to see a lot more hands. Um, it's kind of hard to see, you know, on a computer, like what's, what's better and what's worse, but it is, it is clear from these hands, at least when I look at it carefully, right? If you look at the fingers and you look at, you know, rapamycin treatment and placebo, at least, you know, here, this is an older hand and you could certainly see less wrinkling, smoother skin, um, you know, on, if you were going to use this Mert scale, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's not changing a 70 year old hand to a 20 year old hand, but there is a, there is a statistically uh, significant and also a visible difference, um, you know, between the hands that they're, you know, I mean, uh, they look certainly smoother. So these folks are on their way to be hand models um, if they keep applying rapamycin. So, um, so they have this, so here's their, so I used, I showed this Mert scale and they have this Glogau aging scale and wrinkling and you could look up these scales. Um, I don't know why the p-value for this Glogau aging scale is not really so consistent, but uh, the wrinkling and the Mertz dis dispigmentation scale, um, because you, you I probably re refers to the, you know, um, uh, distribution of maybe lip effusion, but p-values are, you know, it's it's a budding p, you know, slightly less than 0.5, so you know, significant there. The variability there is, you know, I don't know exactly. Um, I want to say that they used a software to analyze the two, but you know, I don't know how much subjectivity there is to to uh, rating this. Because if we scroll, we scroll down here. Here's the scale, right? So you get numbers, and I showed you that that scale there, where it goes from like uh, zero to like four or five, right? So um, you know, it's not the it's not the finest scale, right? So uh, so you, so these are all the numbers that were given between treated and untreated clinical score for individual subjects at final visit. Um, and I want to go, I want to just scroll right back up here to the methods and just take another look and see, make sure clinical assessment evaluate each study. Um, okay, so I believe that these were probably done by I. So these weren't so so yeah. So the immunohistochemistry, those those numbers were done by you know software, but but the clinical assessment of dermal tissue was done by probably a dermatologist. So um, you know, so there's a little bit of subjective or a lot of subjective variability there in in assessing that. But despite that, you know, there is a significant difference. Um, um, scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay. Is there any more data? No, there is no more data. <laughs> I want to stop sharing this. So uh, the significance of this is, um, you know, I think it's really cool that number one, you're, you're, we're using a drug that has a, you know, very good safety profile, been used for a long time, a very low dose. I mean, incredibly low dose, 10 micromolar. It's used in a very non-invasive way, topical treatment of a cream. Um, you know, these are results um, that people can see Right. So, I mean, and, and this is very, it's surprising that this is the very first study where they actually do this. And they even mentioned that, you know, for, for looking at a human, some, you know, some attribute of human aging, there was only one other study with rapamycin and that was in 2016. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there, you could see that when I mentioned, you know, they use significant orders of magnitude, more dosages for other conditions safely. Um, so there's a lot of room there to, you know, to certainly um, to, uh, to increase the dosage, um, increase the time, because it was used to six to eight months to, to do follow-up studies with these people to see how long, um, how long these results last. Um, uh, different carriers, right? I think they use the base of DMSO, but are there other ways to administer rapamycin? We also mentioned um, rapalogs. Um, there's different variants of rapamycin, um, and just never mind rapamycin. Um, different topological or different, uh, you know, different not topological, different um, topical administrations of other interventions that they mentioned in the paper. You know, um, uh, precursors to NAD, for example, metformin, all sorts of other 
other compounds, can they have the same effect um, on, on, the, on the derma, right? So, you know, um, I, I know, you know, Keith from our organization, he's like super keen on cosmeceuticals because it's like one of these things that everybody could see the results, right? I mean, you can, you can blather all you want that it's gonna lower P16 levels and do all of these things, but if you can see an improvement in somebody, right? You know, if you can physically see it, and as they say, right, seeing is believing. Um, so that's exciting. And uh, this isn't, and this isn't, uh, this isn't some uh, cosmet you know, cosmetic cover up. We're actually evidently getting at the root cause of, of, of what's, you know, leading to um, uh, aged skin here. And it's very interesting to see that, you know, that um, collagen seven levels, you know, which a lot of these um, extracellular matrix molecules are long lived, tend to be reestablished. Um, is it having an effect on crosslinks, right? There's a lot of still other things to study here, um, you know, that I, that the authors didn't look at um, for, you know, for, you know, we can, I can critique the authors and say, well, they didn't look at this, they didn't look at that, you know, but, you know, they, they looked at what they did look at and it's very promising. So there, there should be a follow-up study that looks at, uh, you know, whether, whether crosslinking, crosslinks are reversed, maybe, maybe not, you know, is, are there certain things, you know, that can be reversed using topical administration of factors that inhibit or remove senescent cells? Um, you know, are there certain things that can be reversed and are there certain things that can't be reversed using this methodology, right? So that would be, that would be an interesting exploration in of itself in, in a follow-up paper. Um, so it's a very short study. Well, I mean, short, six to eight months, so fairly long actually. Um, you know, small sample size, um, but it's very promising. Um, so we have some questions here from the audience. Um, Linda Ingmanson, I would love to try it on my skin, but how to get it? Well, I mean, I'm not advocating self-experimentation, but there's certainly rapamycin is, you know, it's available, you know, through prescription for, for other conditions. And certainly if you are affiliated with a laboratory or other commercial venture or, you work at uh, a offsite biotech lab like GenSpace. You could probably have it shipped to you as a as a as a <clears throat> as a for research purposes only compound. And depending on which company you get it from, it's probably going to be um, kind of expensive or super expensive or not that expensive. And um, and I'm I'm sure there's people out there that are self experimenting. Um, buy it from Sigma. Let's put it that way, Oliver. Yeah, I, Sigma is Sigma is <clears throat> is 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 a lot of money. So a Sigma Aldrich, if you're gonna if you're gonna yeah. get get your chemicals from Sigma, and I don't think they don't really mention in this paper where they got um, their resveratrol. Not their resveratrol. Their up uh, their rapamycin. And obviously, um, obviously Sigma is expensive because it's extremely uh, pure and it's quality assured. Yeah, that's the line anyway. But I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's Santa Cruz bio. I was, I, I basically looked it up myself. There's, there's a lot of, yeah. you know, biotech supply houses out there that, that, you know, sell rapamycin. I believe it comes in a powder form. Um, but then there's the issue of compounding it, right? Because mm. you can't, you can't just put powdered rapamycin on your hand. It's not going to do anything. You need some kind of carrier to have it penetrate. And they mentioned here that they use the placebo, DMSO. DMSO, which is a go-to carrier, um, that basically um, permits things to enter through the lipid bile layer. Um, you, can, once, you can buy dim so over the counter. Um, yeah, because it's quite it's it's commonly used for all sorts of things, isn't it? Like a as as a gel, as a like a a, a gel, you can you can literally buy it in the uh, the chemists. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, one speculative question I have is: Would rapamycin have to be applied to the skin for effect, or would systemic usage work as well? Building work, uh, uh, building work going on, so, so we'll not use my. To ask my mom, she's currently mills. Okay, um, so that's that's another question I have. So, depending on how you take some of these compounds, they you you get more or better administration. If you, I mean, if you swallow something and it goes through your small intestine, it, it'll. I think grow go primarily and get metabolized by the liver, right? So some a lot of it's not absorbed, um, versus a more direct route, which is if you're trying to affect 
you know, cells that are right on the dermis or right under the epidermis, then, then a topical administration would probably be the most direct route. There's also sublingual administrations of drugs where they dissolve and are absorbed through the blood vessels, you know, under your tongue. So again, I think they bypass primarily the liver and liver metabolism. So there's different routes that you can take it. So I don't, I, short answer is I have no idea how much rapamycin would get to the dermis versus other organs if you ingested it. It would depend on a lot of things. It would depend on the amount you ingest, the formulation, you know, the, the, the way it's compounded, you know, um, is, it, is, it, is it micronized? Is it, you know, how, how are you taking it? Um, probably even whether you're taking with a meal or not with a meal. Um, and frankly, I don't know if anybody's really done those experiments, which is basically to see what the systemic distribution is of rapamycin, you know, cause they look at, they look at rapamycin levels in the blood and that's it. But how much of it is, ends up in different tissues. Um, I don't, I don't know if those experiments have been done. I mean, these are all lengthy experiments that cost money, right? So, so, you know, um, um, time is money, time is limited, resources are limited, people want to study a million different things. So um, I don't, you know, and these are all important experiments. And I don't know if anybody's really done those types of systemic analyses. Um, Ludovico, is rapamycin delivered through liposomes or just coated in the lipidic cream? So again, they used, they used DMSO and I don't know what else was in that cream. They said cream. So I'm, I'm taking, it's not just DMSO and rapamycin. It's what probably some standard dermatologic base that is, you know, I'd have to look this up. I'm sure for these, I'm sure they didn't get too crazy. I'm, I, I'm just guessing here. I'm, I'm sure that they probably used something that's used in cosmeceuticals and dermatology as a base carrier for, for whatever the topical administration is. And I don't know what, what it would be, maybe some sort of plant oil or petroleum jelly. I don't know. I would have to look that up. Um, uh, it's dim, so come on. Everyone uses dim, so well they said cream, so that tells me that it's some sort of some sort of uh, gel-like matrix of of something, right? If if it's a cream, um, I don't know, <clears throat> but I, I am super excited that uh, you know, hey, just you know, fill up the tub with cream and rapamycin and just soak in it for that's you know. Actually, funny enough, that's what I was th I was uh, I was actually thinking that. Um, you know? I mean, yeah. You, Obviously, you'd have to investigate whether uh, rapamycin, how how it was affected by temperature, uh, you know, would 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 putting it in a in a warm bath, you know, would would that affect it? Right, or would you just you know slather yourself up and wrap yourself up in saran wrap, right? No, yeah, I think of... that's getting a bit freaky. You know, you'll be onto the yes. bubble wrap next. Uh, that, that's just getting a bit freaky. But Maybe no, that's... I mean, you know, joking aside, a bath is 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 something that they they uh, sometimes use in dermatology. Hmm. Uh, so for for example, like the bleach bath, um, I know that. Is, I... is an approach that they use huh. for um, bacterial issues in dermatology. Okay, well, I mean, you know, we go to swimming pools. That's got that's got that's chlorinated, and we yeah. we we people have mud baths. People, you know, I mean, do all sorts of topical administration of all kinds of stuff that they soak in so maybe that's work, what yeah. maybe that's what cleopatra used i have no idea i know she what, was rapamycin <laughs> i know she was bit by an asp but that's about it well that's all right a, that's a, that's another story i think for another time but unless uh, unless cleopatra did visit rapa nui uh, on easter island i'm pretty sure she probably wouldn't have had access to it I think I think I think we're crossing streams with like Thor Heyerdahl and and other other um, you know what I'm talking about Contiki, right? Okay. You should ne never never cross the streams was, was yeah, a piece we, of advice I was always taught never cross streams. Yeah, as much as we like to delve into the history and 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 the routes of ancient mariners, we probably don't want to discuss it here because we'll get way off topic real fast, and you know, and pretty soon it'll turn into the History Channel. Um, and things will get re weird real quick. Um, that's good sometimes. Maybe that's what yeah, she did bathe in milk. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll hold off on on what Cleopatra may have used. Um, Maybe but, a rapalog, Oliver. She might have actually found a rapalog. Could have been. I mean, you know, ancient ancient. Um, you know, certainly 
I mean, rapamycin was found in a microbe that was found in the soil of, 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 of an island. So, I mean, and people do mud baths, right? So maybe right? so if certain soil might have certain constituents that are beneficial hey i'm going out on a limb here but you know whatever it's it's fun to speculate but there um, are the rapalogs aren't there of yeah, course um, yeah. you know joking aside there are such things as rapalogs which are compounds that are very very similar chemically to rapamycin and only differ slightly in their um their structure and they've been found in uh, in other naturally occurring uh, places you know such as plants and things like that so that that is also something else that's being investigated are the rapalogs mm -hmm. which are analogs of uh you know the rapamycin they also target the mTOR pathway and may be more efficient in doing so so i'm yeah. personally following that and i'm quite excited about rapalogs yeah and i'm and and, and you know i i, I think dermatology is a great way to go and again keith, keith has mentioned this before more to me you know it's it's a very promising avenue people are interested in outer appearances for obvious reasons and if you can actually target the aging the fundamental mechanisms of aging then as our current models suggest um this should work for every tissue type or every organ system every cell type if you're really getting at the root causes as you know rapamycin is targeting some of these pathways that are found in every cell um, then, you know, what proves to be beneficial, you know, from a dermatology standpoint will be beneficial for hopefully for neurons, for, you know, for other, for other cell types. Um, so, you know, I, I like this multi-pronged approach, you know, it's probably less controversial to do, you know, again, I'm not a clinician, so I don't know how easy it is to carry out these clinical studies, but I'm assuming it's probably easier to, to carry out or at least to get, um, approval for a dermatologic type of, you know, test, um, especially since th there's no disease state here and, you know, it's dermatology. So they do have this grading scale for how skin looks. So you're not saying you're curing aging. You're just saying that you're making the skin look better, right? So it's, 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 it's whatever is on this Mert scale or all these other scales. And it just so happens that these scales um, are calibrated to the human aging process, right? That's so, so you know, you are de facto measuring, you know, um, a reversal of um, fundamental processes of aging. Um, so I think it's really, I think it's really cool that, that we have this, we have this trial here and I'd love to see um, other, other compounds that have already been tested, you know, and they mentioned several in the paper, uh, you know, and I don't know if they're going to be the ones that, that are, that are going to, that are going to carry it out. Um, but um but yeah, um, I could see Keith Richards and, uh, and Mick Jagger signing up. To be quite honest, it wouldn't be the first time that they've um, they've tried anti-aging um, therapies either. They've uh, they tried um, plasma infusion as well. So yeah, can you imagine that? Yeah, the aged uh, Keith Richards or uh, a Mick Jagger. Something's keeping them, that now, some, something something's keeping them going, right? They're 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 past seventy, right? Well, like, you know, I've got to say, I wouldn't mind the moves like Jagger, you know, and I wouldn't mind his money either. So uh, sign me up. Yeah. Um, so again, um, a, a, a small paper with regards to you know um, trial participants. Um, you know, um, one thing one thing that uh, I mentioned before is you know it's it's. Uh, it's hard to figure out how to make a, a, a bigger trial because really, you know, you'd like to see hundreds, you'd like to see thousands, you'd like to see 10,000 people. Um, but it's, 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 um, it's really hard to do. Um, there's, you know, to, to, to kind of, especially if you want to do these types of measurements, um, because like you, like I, I sh, you know, like they, the authors pointed out, out of 36 people, almost half dropped out for a variety of reasons, right? I mean, they just moved town, they got sick and tired of something they didn't want to give a biopsy they you know um i keep getting uh i keep getting um phone calls to donate blood i, I do i did donate blood I, but it's inconvenient for me to go halfway across town to donate blood right so um so being being a trial participant also kind of uh, it's a problem here uh so some steve 
to everyone. Yeah, L'Oreal is getting interested in the field. So honestly, they would have the kind of capacity to say, yep, L'Oreal. Um, so there's a lot of these big companies out there, L'Oreal being one of them, which have no doubt huge resources. And, um, you know, uh, as, as the molecular understanding for aging and also longevity pathways, longevity maintenance pathways, I would call them, um, you know, um, gets on further firmer foundations as it as it has been in the past you know several years um we're going to start seeing um i think more of these um more of these interventions from big companies like l'oreal um certainly i think certainly for a number of years there's already been you know um cosmeceutical um applications using epidermal growth factor um but this is you know this is something you know even simpler and it's and it's really targeting, it's a small molecule targeting, you know, a, a pathway that, that can affect the rate of aging. So um, um, wouldn't be surprised if we, if we start seeing, um, seeing this uh, hit the market fast, really. Um, certain irony in that though, isn't there? Um, you know, uh, cosmetic companies have traditionally been associated with uh, bending the truth. And oh, yeah, yeah. Make or, wouldn't it be ironic that someone like L'Oreal or uh, you know uh, one of the other the, one of the other big skincare companies actually started funding and field and then even selling potentially a um, an actual true uh, anti aging uh, therapy that would be interesting right bit bit ironic but it'd be quite funny yeah it would it definitely would um, so you know um, so yeah I mean it's it. Uh, so, you know, obviously research like this is, is definitely re required to make sure that um, it's, it's really, really working and you're not just getting something that just kind of covers up your, your blemishes, right? Um, and because uh, we, we are interested here at LEAF in really tackling the fundamental mechanisms of aging and really understanding longevity path maintenance pathways, long, you know, pathways that maintain longevity. And... Um, so yeah, um, uh, I am not biased against uh, any organ system that is that is you know being targeted uh, as far as uh, an anti-aging intervention. So I think this might actually be the first paper we did that was actually dermatology, cosmeceutical type of paper. I think I'm, hmm. I don't. I think it, I think it might be. Um... There are, you know, there are other uh, papers in relation to skin. Uh, there has been a senescent cell uh, study, at least to my knowledge, quite recently that mm -hmm. showed, you know, the contribution of senescent cell accumulation mm -hmm. in skin aging, which is perhaps something that we can touch upon. Uh, for me, I mean, personally, I've, uh, obviously appearances uh, are important to people. Uh, I think skin is an excellent target, uh, firstly, because people are very appearance oriented and results in skin will grab public attention but also mm -hmm. because of its accessibility it's super easy to to do to do studies on skin as opposed to sort of organs that are deeper in the body and it's not like you can easily do biopsies and such like mm -hmm. um, so skin's a fantastic target uh, in that respect and also because it's well arguably it's the largest organ in the body Mm -hmm. um, and obviously even the internal organs have, you know, some of the, uh, the elements that our external skin do as well. Right. So right. you're coded inside and out with epithelial cells, right? You are. So, and, and, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it, I, I, you know, my hope is that this would be a positive feedback loop where basically the public would go, Oh my God, we're finally seeing results. And it's not because of some sort of, you know, uh, no pun intended, cover up. It's actually getting at the root causes. And hopefully the, the profits then can be reinvested in further research, you know, much like what's happened with computers, right? We have, I have a phone in my pocket, it's a supercomputer. And uh, the public, meaning myself, we find this, this stuff super useful. So we buy it and, you know, makes companies tons and tons of money and they reinvest a big chunk of that money. Um, well, CEO salaries, of course, but and but a lot of that money also goes back to making better and faster computers and um, and so on and so forth it goes. Um, 
writing, you know, writing some abstract equations on, on the blackboard and saying, you know, um, this will theoretically speed up, you know, this, you know, this computational process. Um, it's not going to light the flame under the public and they're not going to give you any money. But if you, if you show them something that can play home videos in your pocket, all of a sudden they're like, my God, you know, that, that equation is, is correct. <laughs> um, so hopefully we have some sort of this type of translation happening with, with um, fundamental aging research, getting into a product, public seeing that it's having an actual health benefit um, and then the public essentially voting with their dollars and round and round civilization goes, hopefully in, you know, progresses to a, a better and better state. Well, that's quite the, uh, the, the utopian vision you've got there, Oliver. It's nice to be positive anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, sure, there's going to be fits and starts along the way, but, you know, I'm going to just ignore the occasional uh, thermonuclear holocaust that might pop up now and then. But we'll, we'll just take that. But I, I think um, I think we need to be be, be optimistic here. We do, and uh, yeah, I'm definitely uh, interested in developments along these lines, especially with skin. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, I'm I'm not a vain person, but uh, I'm certainly not going to turn down the opportunity to have a few less wrinkles, and I don't think most people uh, would turn it away. You know, yeah, and like and, and like I said, we're you know I, I don't want to conflate this with vanity. We're not really mm -hmm. you know we're not it's not it's not um, I know people you know that's that's one of the I don't even know is it one of the seven deadly sins vanity I don't think so it's uh, but certainly people you know people um, you know it's certainly mocked that you 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 know we we want to look younger and 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 so on and so forth. Um, it's not really looking younger in this case, it's really being and feeling younger, meaning in younger in the sense of healthier, right? Nobody, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna knock you for wanting to be healthier, um, yeah. where you're less of a burden to others and less of a burden to yourself and, you know, and um, can contribute more. So, you know, we're, um, we're certainly the goal here is that uh, I'm interested and everybody here is interested in, ingredients that will, you know, again, I just want to emphasize hit the root causes of aging uh, as, as we now start to elucidate these mechanisms more and more, better and better. Um, and that uh, it's not just that we're going to look better because, you know, we're masking something, but that we're actually, you know, um, being healthier um, at the cellular level. So that's, that's really the goal. And um, there's no, there's no way around it. If you're actually targeting the root causes of aging, um, you should look younger. You, you will, you will look younger. And and age, skin is 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 a major organ. So if you're tackling aging, you you will and should uh, look younger than your your years um, would indicate. Yeah, you know. And if you, if that, you know. And if this science means that you know you're going to look ripped and have a killer bod when you're on the beach, then you know just a sacrifice we're willing to make isn't it yeah i know it's 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 Go not what it, i'm you know? it's not what i'm aiming for you know it's 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 um you know it's it, it'll it'll be our cross to bear we're just gonna have to look good we're just gonna have to settle for looking good in a, in a bathing suit i'm just we're just gonna you know. have to suck it up aren't we you know yeah. i mean that's just that's just one of the 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 risks that's involved i'm it's willing one of, to that's, take that it's one of the side effects so that's unfortunate but there you go <laughs> <laughs> So there we go. But, um, you know, it, but it does go, I mean, the studies like this do go to highlight the fact that this technology, which has been, you know, talked about for 10, 20 years, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's finally starting to sort of trickle through, but that's because obviously the, the, the clinical trial process is slow. Science is slow. Um, but it, we are really now starting to get there. You know, there are, not just this, but there are other examples now where technologies are finally filtering through to humans. Look at Greg Fahey, uh, for example, where he reversed the uh, aging of the thymus. I was, uh, I was informed today, uh, uh, by the way, that they've actually now started to take on uh, uh, sign-ups for a uh, for further for further studies uh, in California uh, for. Uh, 
well, what pretty much what they did before they uh, for uh, aging of the thymus. So, you know, this is in people, this is happening. Um, studies like that and this one finally starting to show that, hey, we you know, we're getting there. It's been a long road, but we're starting to get there. Yeah. And, you know, it, it again, to be more optimistic, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, that there'll be a critical mass of, of when, once, you know, once aging and mechanisms of aging and longevity pathways are, are worked out in greater and greater detail and there is much more, um, you know, a, a confluence of opinion where everybody is in agreement that this, you know, that this is what every, these systems have in common, um, then we should start seeing an exponential increase, a rapid increase in, in you know, in testing in this direction. Um, because for many years, that's what's been holding holding this research back is, you know, aging is not considered a disease. We've always aged. Nothing's going to reverse aging, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, now the basic research is, is showing that this is not correct, that that thinking and that model, that paradigm is, is, is not right. And once people realize this, people that have money, like L'Oreal's of the world and, and other corporations, once they are convinced that the science is right, um, I think that's going to be a huge incentive to push this um, into, into the next level. Well, you know, as, I, as the meme goes, they can shut up and take my money if it works. So sign me up. All right. So yeah, so promising early results for what is, let's face it, an extremely small dosage. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested to see other, you know, studies involving higher or different uh, dosages, and and see where we go from there. But I think it's a solid mm -hmm. start. Always come in low um, in these things, so you don't kill your uh, your study participants. Mm -hmm. Usually a good. It's usually a good sort of uh, metric, mm -hmm. not killing your patients, right? Uh, you know, on the initial studies. So, but I mean, as you say, we we know that it's safely used at many times more that dosage anyway mm -hmm. for uh, for other skin conditions uh, like you know bacterial skin conditions. So, yeah. So look forward to seeing more, and I think we probably will. I don't know if rapamycin is a generic or, or you know, off patent. I don't probably even know is. if you could actually patent it anyway. Yeah, probably it, not. Yeah. Then again, it's a naturally occurring um, compound, isn't it? That was found yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the soil of Rapa Nui. So yeah, I don't somebody, even think it could be yeah, patented. Yeah, Chris says it's generic now. So, so again, there's a lot of room for 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 study, and and I would say a good follow up study. Obviously, you know, the obvious would be increasing dosages, but a, another great follow up study would be looking at these other compounds. And we've studied, we've looked at other papers where we basically showed that hitting multiple pathways that are partially orthologous to one another um, has a synergistic effect on on the lifespan of fruit flies and you know and C. elegans. Um, so. You know, if we combine rapamycin with other other compounds, you know, uh, you know, they mentioned in the paper um, um, uh, precursors to NAD, for example, um, metformin, certain polyphenols. If we can, if you know, if there's a, if if we can intelligently put together a, a formulation that has several compounds that is known to target several, you know, side by side pathways um, that are known to be impact the aging process, then, um, then the theory, the prediction is that we should see even better results than this paper has shown. Um, so we, we already, so I, I'm, I'm already throwing out a, a theory here that's based on, on the papers we've already, uh, already suggested that if we, if we target several, you know, uh, several orthologous pathways, several pathways that kind of, you know, not, interact not not overlap too much um you know using two or three compounds at once then you know um not only for other things but just focusing on this one dermatologic aspect we should we should see a significant uh uh improvement right maybe maybe it won't take six to eight months maybe it'll take six weeks of work maybe the mert scale will will be off the charts for you know these like i don't know but um, but that is certainly a 
So right now, what I'm saying is that I, I wouldn't be able to make this prediction 15 years ago because mm -hmm. these papers hadn't come out to suggest that, that, that this, is, this would be a way to intervene targeting multiple pathways that, uh, that uh, and you would get an additive or synergistic effect. So um, that is a prediction I'm, I'm making and um, no doubt somebody is working on that experiment right now. You can bet on it. Yep. Like uh, Chris Linnell said, like rapa lithium and uh, trametinib from last year's combo synergistic fly lifespan study, right? So as long as we can combine things that are, you know, soluble in DMSO and can get into the derma, um, let's try it. Why not? Why not indeed? You have nothing but to lose but your wrinkles. Exactly. All right. Well, I think... Um, I think that might be it. I think uh, we've had a lot of great questions come through, and uh, you know, this was a, you know, this was a very, very focused trial. But I think it's a, it's a nice one to start start off the new year. Um, it is apropos, right? The new year starts off with a with a young baby that's got a banner that says 2020, and we're looking at young young skin here. So there you go. Yeah. So there you go. I'm hoping that I can buy that soon. And um, fingers crossed. That, that will happen, but we'll keep you posted anyway. So do keep an eye on our website for more news as it comes in. And thanks for everybody who's joined us today. Um, it's been great, and especially for all the questions. It's always good um, when it's a, a study about humans rather than mice. You know, we like the mice, but it's always better to see the things that get gotten through to human stage. Mm -hmm. But there you go. You've got to do the mouse work first. Those are the rules. But this one is, um, is, is a great start for the year, as Oliver said. Mm -hmm. So thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks to Chris uh, as well for joining us, one of our Lifespan heroes. Speaking of the Lifespan heroes, uh, a big thank you to them for supporting us every, uh, every month there and allowing us to make shows and, uh, 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 such as this and other events. And if you're interested in supporting us, um, if you want to uh, visit us over at lifespan.io forward slash hero, you can find out how you might do that. So uh, next month, um, what have we got, Oliver? I think we've got a, an exciting one about. Yeah, I've got to reach out to uh, got to reach out to Chris Mason and uh, uh, Chris Mason and um, other potential collaborators on a project that I'm going to be launching on lifespan.io and basically we're going to be it's it's kind of a nitty-gritty dive so i need experts to back me up on this we're basically going to be looking at um i'm going to try to recruit some authors to help me out on this so i got to send out those emails um to basically go over a methodology to look at the three-dimensional architecture of chromatin chromatin so um so just kind of a just sort of to compare it to what we just discussed right now um you age you get wrinkly skin um, well, guess what? Your nuclei wrinkle too, and your chromatin kind of wrinkles too in a very kind of disorganized way. And how it specifically wrinkles as we grow older, um, that, the hypothesis we have um, is that uh, it might tell us something about which genes are involved in the aging process. And to figure out specifically how chromatin, chromatin wrinkles, we need to use a very sophisticated um, technique um, using basically methods that are uh, under the umbrella of a term called uh, chromatin confirmation capture technology, which is basically looking at the spatial positioning of different regions of chromosomes and how they're basically um, laid out in the nucleus and how they change over time uh, as an organism changes. So we're gonna, you know, we're hopefully gonna do a deep dive um, into that technology that allows us to take a snapshot um, and look at the wrinkling of um, double-stranded DNA and chromosomes within the nucleus. And um, questions are, um, how does that wrinkling change? Does it change as we grow older? We know that the epigenome changes and we know that nuclear morphology changes and we're looking sort of at a, in the middle state, do, does, does the uh, positioning of certain genes um, also change? And how does that connect to um, genes that might underlie um, mechanisms of longevity? So that is a heads up for next month. So, yeah. Wow. That sounds pretty exciting, uh, folks. 
I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. And it sounds like that the, um, the classic double helix shape of DNA that we're all taught that that's what DNA looks like is a lie. It doesn't really look like that, folks. And Oliver's going to find out exactly what it looks like. Well, it, it, it does look like that, but in the chromatin, it, it, it does a lot of, it's compacted in a lot of other ways. I mean, yeah, so. it's not quite so clear cut as people would uh, have us believe, is it? Or pretty. But there we not go. like us. Oh dear. And, okay. on, uh, and, uh, and on that, <laughs> and things are going downhill. So on that <laughs> note, we will, uh, we will see you all later. And thanks to everybody that's joined us. We will uh, we'll keep you posted and let you know when the next one is. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Take care and see you next month.